Hi, this is Rick Hart, and this is part three of my uh, uh, presentation of the book Voices After Evelyn. This section is probably the most fun. The um, main point I'd like to get across, first of all, is that the discipline called anthropology, it could be argued, is the study of cultures that were slowly extinguished or shunted aside by a far less humane society, culture, civilization with far worse ideas that treated human beings inhumanely and still does and always will. Even the globe is threatened. But um, in this case, case of a babysitter who was probably raped and murdered, um, disappeared in 1953, uh, is uh, um, uh, evidence enough because it wasn't a singular event. But very uh, many things about it were, were indeed singular. Um, but anyway, the the connection that I make to primitive or what we call primitive cultures, um, village cultures, and so on, um, we're not as good at this one as um, uh, at, at defending itself from the wilderness, from wild animals. And I view this um, case as the moment when those still naive uh, realized that they could not protect their daughters. Evelyn Hartley was the village um, girl stolen by the wolf taken away. Now, when that happens, all the mechanisms of law and order were set into motion in La Crosse, Wisconsin. What did they do? Well, they established a perimeter around the scene of the crime, two block perimeter. They were smart enough not to let um, curious onlookers um, get close to um, possible evidence like um, the blood stains that I mentioned earlier and like what I believe were tire tracks. The streets around that um, house that she was taken from were dirt. And uh, so they, I believe they had a tire print. Um, I don't know if I ever came across that fact, but as in um, cases even back then, much was withheld from the public so that they could uh, sift through um, various clues in the future. And they could talk to someone like Ed Gein, um, the famous uh, 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 human skin uh, artist and ask a couple of questions and know immediately that it wasn't him, that he had nothing to do with the case. Only recently have I read that Ed Gein was given a lie detector test. Well, he wouldn't be the only one. And um, it, was, it was quite a spectacle. But first thing that happened, the first thing that the police did was gather 
citizens to, I mean, besides studying the crime scene and um, finding evidence like um, uh, footprints and tire prints and to, uh, um, uh, you know, whatever evidence they could get, blood types, they could only type the blood. And it was Evelyn's blood type and that of 40% of lacrosse that was found um, around the scene of the crime, wiped on nearby houses and so on. Um, it probably was Evelyn's blood, probably. But maybe one of the killers had uh, type A as well. I don't know, but the, <laughs> the after that, of course, many people in the town, thousands of people in the town, um, cooperated with the police in searching abandoned areas, and uh, the bean fields that I mentioned earlier were searched, and I was able, you know, when I researched this to talk to many people who had actually uh, taken part in the search. And um, that all that makes perfect sense. Um, her brother um, rushed back to La Crosse. Um, he was going to a university somewhere, I don't know where. Um, but he, he um, discovered under an overpass or in a sewer. There are all kinds of uh, um, um, stories about this. Um, but somebody, maybe it wasn't the brother, but I have this image in my head of the brother. Uh, I read once um, that he, he was um, looking through the sewer system and he found um, a pair of underwear and a bra. And only recently have I come across the detail that it was stained with blood that matched his sister's. Uh, that may not be true. Um, I don't know why I never heard it before. Maybe over time, I, I was writing this uh, novel in the late 1990s. And so I was talking to people in that time period. And maybe since then, more evidence has uh, been made available to the public, to researchers. Um, a book was written about this, um, an, a, a true crime book that I believe um, detailed the likely suspect. And we'll get to that later. But uh, the, um, the evidence uh, that I've come up with from researching it in the last couple of days, in other words, watching YouTube, uh, has uh, added to what I knew before, but I don't know how well these shows are put together. So um, things like the, you know, I, I knew that some of her underclothing may have been found. Um, and even even what I've seen in the last week or so has conflicted with um, each other. You know, like some one one article said that they found um, the bra and underwear, and it was a common brand, and Evelyn had this similar type or whatever. Um, another said that it was blood stained and it was Evelyn's blood, and anyway, it uh, was found. Um, I believe, um, in the direction of Highway 14, a highway that turns east south of the town and goes predominantly um, east, east southeast from La Crosse, Wisconsin. And that's probably true because uh, the, the uh, investigators um, searched that highway. Maybe they searched every highway around there. Um, I don't know. But they, they found what they considered evidence um, and what uh, in my book is referred to, among the other things, as a steeplejack's jacket. Um, 
There are more details now about that jacket. Now, now some say that it had blood on it. Um, but the, the main thing that I found about it, which was from sources that were valid at that time and may still be valid, was that um, uh, it was the jacket of a very, very short man. Um, it had the wear marks of the kind of uh, um, straps that a steeplejack would use and um, tool belts and whatever. I don't, I, I, you know, I, I don't know what it, I couldn't find a denim, it was a denim jacket. I couldn't pick up a denim jacket and say, hey, this looks like a steeplejack's jacket, but they did. Uh, and it was never questioned. They also found near that a pair of shoes. And the shoes um, were said to match sh shoes that were uh, found around the car or where the car had been. And maybe even some of the um, clumps of dirt in the house. There may have been a footprint found in the house. And so these shoes and that jacket were considered to be um, what the killer was wearing um, and uh, were thrown out of the car as it f uh, raced out of town with Evelyn in it. But um, what I thought was hilarious throughout this time was that there was always, they were always talking about one killer and um, so there, the, the shoes were size 11. And so that suggests a relatively tall person. I wear a size 11, I'm six foot two. Um, the steeple jack jacket was that of a shorter person, much shorter. And so they were looking I, I, for a midget steeple jack with giant feet is how I saw it. And, uh, of course, it could have been two people, one short, one tall, simple. So it, it's not as absurd as it sounds. Um, although from what I uh, found when I was looking into this in the late 1990s was that there was really um, uh, no solid evidence linking um, the jacket and the shoes and um, so it, it, it seemed very strange. But a, um, after a short time, the investigation was turned over to a super investigator, um, maybe the head investigator of La Crosse County. I'm not sure. I don't know much about the person except that he was fucking crazy. And he was just insistent that these clues were valid and these were the shoes of the killer and the fun thing about the shoes they look like converse all-stars um, but they had wear marks on them that were studied and found to be consistent with those of the um, what was known at the time as the whizzer motorbike and uh, um, the Wizard motorbike was the kind, I guess, you, 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 uh, it's got a motor on it. You pedal a little bit and the motor starts up and then you're more or less riding a motorcycle. So the Wizard, <laughs> the Wizard motorbike rider, every, everybody who had one was a suspect. Everyone who bought one, they were looked into thoroughly. You know, the, the one thing you could not say about the police is that they shirked their duty. They did everything they could. Um, but some of it was really bizarre. Primarily, my favorite is, has to do with what I talked about in the last segment, where this organism of the town wanted to prove that it was innocent. And they went so far as to try to get 
a look at every single car that was driven in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Now, this, you may think, well, if the car uh, went out Highway 14, and that highway goes way out into the country, and um, I, I don't know, maybe 100 miles or so, it's 160 kilometers to you Europeans, and um, if that's, they were using evidence that was thrown from a car that was hightailing it out of town, why are they looking at every single car? Well, they weren't actually looking at every single car. What they were doing, it was voluntary. Um, uh, I guess even back then, certain rights were, were considered inviolable. Um, they couldn't, um, and, and it would be uh, infeasible as well, they couldn't check every single car. So what they decided to do was set up this system. They printed a bunch of um, stickers that in a, almost a, a, a sub-teenager's uh, um, or a preteen's handwriting said, my car is okay. They handed them out to all the gas stations in the town and people were encouraged to go to the gas stations and gas station attendants would check the cars to make sure there was no blood or um, panties, I guess, I don't know, in the back seat or the trunk. And if you took your car to the gas station and the gas station attendant found you, you know, to be without a body in the trunk and, you know, without uh, blood, whatever, then you would get the sticker, my car is okay. <laughs> and I've even seen, I've seen photos of that sticker. It's, it's just hilarious. I know somebody who told me he was about 10 or 11 when his family drove um, the long way from French Island, which is in the Mississippi, uh, an island in the Mississippi, that's part of La Crosse, where the airport is. And they, they lived on French Island and they drove um, to a gas station. And um, they, he, he said he, he could, he, he'll, he'll never forget the, the sort of the sense of family pride. He had a sister and a brother and a, his mother and father drove to a gas station, had their car checked. It was okay. Their car was okay. And um, so, uh, how many cars did that? I have no idea. But let's say 30,000? Probably not. But let's say it was 30,000. Uh, I'm certain it wasn't more. Um, how many cars were in La Crosse at that time? Um, 50,000 people or so lived there. And, well, I don't know. Did, was there a car per family then? I, I don't know. But uh, certainly um, nobody who raped and murdered Evelyn Hartley um, pulled into a gas station without cleaning their car. Um, <laughs> dumping the body, for instance. Um, washing the seats, you know, the trunk probably didn't have anything in it. There were witnesses um, uh, who were never clearly um, witnesses of the crime. There was one person who, um, pulling up um, on the street where the car left its uh, marks, um, he pulled up there about the time that the crime happened, um, between 7 and 7.30 in the evening, and he saw a couple of young people, uh, young men and a woman in between, and, and he just thought the woman was drunk and didn't think anything about it. Um, but he picked somebody up, and then they took off, 
And then they were passed by a uh, car that had was driven by one man, and in the back seat there was uh, another man who seemed to be um, holding a, or you know, had his arm around a slumping woman. Um, that very well could have been uh, Evelyn Hartley and the two people who came and took her away out Highway 14, or not. Um, there, there was a lot of, um, let's see, I took a couple of notes, see if I left anything off. Um, the, there were a lot of, a lot of males in the town and many of them went to high school and many of them went to college. Evelyn went to high school and, uh, her father taught at the college. So, uh, this special investigator who came in decided to give every single student at the high school and the college every male student, a lie detector test. And after, I think about 300 had been administered, um, there was an outcry from the parents, you know, saying, this is you know, ridiculous. You can't make our kids do this. You know, you can't put them through this. Um, and so the practice was stopped. Um, that I don't know whatever happened to that guy that investigator, but, um, he didn't solve the crime. However, um, this crime, as I've said, took place in the autumn of 1953. Um, what's remarkable about the events after that, um, are how crazy some are and how diligent the inspectors proved to be. The two most fascinating things were one, and this is this is this story was reported and um, can't be made up. Um, in 1976 or 75, um, a woman was causing a ruckus on a flight from, I think it was um, uh, Morocco to Tehran. I know it was to Tehran. And when the plane landed in Tehran, um, Interpol was there, um, or somebody was, I remember Interpol coming in at some point, but this woman had caused such a ruckus that um, she was arrested. And as they were taking her away, away, she said, you can't do this. I'm Evelyn Hartley. Uh, true story and uh, um, bizarre. She wasn't Evelyn Hartley. And I'm sure that that was established. But because it was an unsolved crime, I'm sure it was looked into to whatever extent it could be a description of the person, whatever. But, uh, um, <laughs> it's just really crazy. And, um, you know, who, who remembered Evelyn Hartley? Who knew of Evelyn Hartley? Well, um, the story was big enough to make news all the way to Chicago. Uh, it was in the Chicago papers, but I don't know if it was nationwide news. Where did I put that uh, here? You know, I'm getting, I'm getting a drippy nose here from all the excitement. Well, the other thing that happened, as it, this is truly astonishing, um, is in 1989, I was living in La Crosse at the time, um, the police received a tip. Nobody would say what the tip was, of course, but it was taken seriously enough that it was acted upon. The tip was that in a, a draw, which is, you know, like a valley that, you know, is, is uh, perpendicular to the, to a river. Um, a car, I think it was a car. No, maybe, maybe that's just our speculation, but, um, bulldozers searched for a couple of days, uh, a 
draw based on a telephone tip that said that Evelyn Hartley was there, was buried in that draw. And it was about 25 miles north of La Crosse along the river near the town of Winona. And, you know, there, there, uh, there were news helicopters and um, it was a really big deal. But, of course, um, nothing was found. Um, I think that the use of bulldozers may have been what uh, made people speculate that they were looking for a car. They, the car that had Evelyn Hartley in it at one time, or still had Evelyn Hartley in it. How do you dispose of a body? Nobody knows, actually, and nobody ever will know. But they did dispose of her body. And uh, in 1989, 36 years after the crime, a phone tip led police to put that much uh, time and effort into looking for her body. Well, they didn't find it. And so... Um, this is this is um, one aspect of the case, or these are uh, some aspects of the case. But another thing that's 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 fun if you live in La Crosse and you talk to people um, is how many people think they know what happened. There was a a, a street named after the film director Joseph Losey's family called Losey Boulevard. It was under construction, some say, at the time of Evelyn Hartley's disappearance, and it was uh, posited that her body was um, buried in there. In So it's under Losey Boulevard, and, uh, um, uh, and there are people who are absolutely certain that that's the case because you know what else would you do with a, a body you know the quickest way to get rid of it there's a construction site nobody's there at night or is there anyway they put a body there they cover it up with dirt the next day it's buried and paved i don't <laughs> i don't know it always struck me as crazy so the these are there there will be n never anything as funny as to me as the uh, 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 town um, handing out my car is okay stickers. Um, and I think it was the combination of the 1989 effort to dig up a draw and look for the car and the my car is okay um, along with one other thing. A friend of mine, her father, a little bit old uh, when I knew him, wonderful guy, fun guy, lots of stories. He always had lots of stories. And he was around when it happened. And uh, he talked about, you know, the, you know, how, how he was part of a search party and, you know, but I imagined him and he was a happy-go-lucky guy. He was a small man. But he was also a boxer in the military and had a good story about the Diamond Belt um, uh, championship fights. And so somehow it dawned on me that he was my main character as a 30-year-old. He would have been 30 at the time that happened. And so, um, and then I also thought, what would a reporter in 1989 um, have thought of that case? You know, a lot of other bizarre things happen in lacrosse. It's a magnet for the bizarre. Uh, another thing that, that um, came up in, during the time I was writing the book um, was that a, a, a woman was arrested for imprisoning her uh, husband, in a sense. He was uh, 
kind of a down and out sort. Um, and he worked at the brewery. They didn't live all that far from the brewery. And um, there was a, at their home, there was an outdoor storm shelter. And she locked him in there um, when he came home from work. He was a janitor at the brewery. And at some point, you know, he was always, he was always kind of messy and, you know, so on. And uh, people were kind to him at the brewery. Um, but it turned out he was living um, in a storm cellar uh, that, he, that was locked when he came home from work. And that story coinciding with the other story, the, the draw, and then imagining this wild and funny guy, um, uh, I won't mention his real name here, probably I could, but no need. Anyway, that coalesced and got me started writing the novel because, you know, the what's most fascinating about most crime stories uh, or what fascinates us the most is the mystery and the mystery being solved and you know we we're all suckers for stories and uh, perverse stories weird you know stories and um, and we want answers and here was one that had no answers other than what I've already suggested, which is it's a violent country and it can't, and our civilization itself is a violent civilization and it cannot, it produces many victims and it cannot protect its own daughters. In the United States, they can't protect their own school children. They won't. Um, you, you know how that functions, of course. But in this case, I thought it would be um, interesting to um, find out as much as I could about the town. And I did find out a lot of interesting information. And so I wrote a novel. And in the next, the fourth segment, I'll talk about um, the characters I chose to use to present this novel. Um, I've given you one, and in the novel he's called Bobby, and he's 30 years old, and uh, we'll get to, uh, this is considered a somewhat transgressive novel. Well, what could be more transgressive than raping and murdering a babysitter? You know, that's, I, I have no qualms about transgressive fiction um, or storytelling. So I'll talk more about that in the next episode where we get into how and why certain things happen in a writer's head and lead to various decisions. That might not be as interesting as today's. I think today's is the most fun. I can't believe over a half an hour has gone by already. Um, well, you probably are asleep by now, so, you know, thanks for trying.